Thanks, Jim. Well, um, I was originally put down um, to talk about the uh, history of um, comms data and traffic data surveillance, but Gus has done that very ably. Um, so I think what I will do um, is focus a little bit more on the hard tech geek stuff. As many of you will remember, we had the crypto wars during the 1990s when people, uh, when governments wanted to take control of cryptographic keys. One of the things we learned then um, is that privacy is largely about abuse of authorized access to data, while surveillance is largely about access to traffic data. And that fine distinction that we drew then seems now on the point of being uh, muddy because the two are going to come together. Uh, but those of you who are around on this scene in 2000 will remember in the run-up to the regulation of investigatory powers act, we lobbied together with Gus and uh, Liberty and others uh, for the big browser amendment, as we call it. Uh, the government said that they would give easy access to traffic data to the police. So what are traffic data if somebody goes to Google and searches, for example, for abortion counseling? Is it HTTP, dub, 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 um, .google.com, or is it that, slash, query, question mark, abortion, and counseling? And the police wanted access to the whole lot. They wanted to know every single search that everybody had made on Google, and they considered that to be traffic data, and it was their right to get it because it was merely maintaining the existing capability that they had with printer meters and people's phone lines. And we managed to muster enough members of the House of Lords um, to see to it that the definition of traffic data was simply enough data to tell you which machine that somebody was communicating with. In other words, www.google.com. Now, what appears to be happening now is that there's an, att an intent to disturb that. Now, another thing that's worth bearing in mind, um, and Peter Sommerino is going to talk about this at very much greater length in the next panel, is that the distinction between traffic data as being harmless and content as being um, sensitive uh, is becoming less and less relevant. Certainly with Google searches, the full URL can be very sensitive indeed. And now that people are living more and more of their lives online, on Facebook and so on, the pattern of who you communicate with and in what order gives away pretty well everything. And this means that in data protection terms, traffic data is now very often going to be specially sensitive data with all that that implies. And I know that Derek Karp will be talking a lot more about that later. So I've got four or five quick technology points. The first is that as we've spoken to members of the senior civil service over the last couple of weeks, um, we've come to the conclusion that many of them are technologically clueless. <laughs> They're telling ministers, minister, you must do this or the world will end. Uh, but they don't know what this is. They've got a few acronyms. So who's driving it? Now, where it seems to be driven is by the tech mafia one or two layers further down. You know, people at the CTO level and DG level and um, former people from such posts who are now advising um, large companies who stand to gain from this. The second point that's worth making is that if we end up putting 10,000 black boxes in Britain's internet, then that isn't just going to be content. Once the black boxes are there, and again, Peter will discuss this later on, um, they are basically programmed by means of scripts that Cheltenham will download to go through the, the bits that fly by and say, I will collect this bit, I will collect this bit, I will forget this bit. And these scripts can be changed on the fly. So you build a capability not just to monitor traffic data, but to monitor content on an industrial scale. The third thing that it's necessary to realize is that given the um, very low cost of data storage nowadays, it is in fact feasible to store everything. All the content of all your phone calls, if you're reasonably smart about it and you throw away the streaming media and the iPlayer and, and all that sort of crap, um, you can do it reasonably efficiently. You can probably store the UK's communications on about 10,000 servers. Right, that's less than 10% of the capacity of one Google data center. You need a similar capacity to do the actual um, front-end filtering. And there are some countries that are already doing this. I talked to a professor from Bangalore yesterday who assures me quite reasonably that India is doing this. And of course, this is one of the reasons that in India, the government demands access to all keys. So it all comes around in the end, and if government starts pulling all the data off the backbone, 
um, so that everything can be stored, or initially at least content, uh, traffic data is stored, then ultimately all the other doors have to be broken down to, to maintain the capability. Because otherwise people will encrypt stuff to prevent things like behavioral advertising. <coughs> the final technical point that I'd like to make is that at present, um, the, there is great disparity in the wiretapping capability between the different ISPs. BT is the most centralized. They've got five big data centers with about 20 DPI boxes <coughs> each. So they can wiretap about 100,000 circuits, whether for DPI or for content, or pursuant to warrants. Now, if you want to do everything, then you basically have to scale that up by two orders of magnitude, which would probably mean a BT building another five data centers and Huawei selling them $200 million worth of kit. Um, overall cost of the project, perhaps a couple of billion, about enough to get a London to Birmingham railway line about as far as China. <laughs> it's definitely something that is affordable on the scale of which governments spend money. But there will be many costs um, that fall in various places indirectly. Now, Trevor here is going to be talking about, I believe, about what the implications would be for competition. Because if you mandate this, it's great for BT, they get to rebuild their network at taxpayers' expense. But it's less great for Virgin, and it can be absolutely dreadful for the small ISPs. So I hope that backbench conservative MPs in particular will be concerned about whether this program undoes all the good work that Margaret Thatcher did in introducing competition into telecoms in the UK. That's the first time we've that line. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do I see medium term? What I think is that this um, proposal to wiretap everything will fail because once society understands what's going on and MPs understand what's going on, there will be an outcry against it. My prediction is that the next fight we'll face, perhaps later this year, is that government will go along to service providers like Facebook and Google and say, guys, we'd like to put some black boxes uh, in your offices. And of course, some firms may say, come back with a warrant, and other firms may say, please put your kit in that cupboard over there. We've seen this pattern before. And the interesting political question is that if privacy comes down to the relationships that government has with a small number of our service providers, then how on earth can we regulate that? How on earth can we trust the government's arrangements that emerge?